Can tell me when I'm good? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Bay Area Creative Freelancers Guild meetup. I am Danielle Valdez from Four Winds Production. And this, so those of you who are new, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our meetup's mission. We want to nurture the creative freelance community through hosted gatherings where we share learnings, work, and opportunities for collaboration. So basically, that's we all get together every month. We have some speakers come in. And hopefully we get to network, get to meet all of you, share some information, collaborate maybe on some projects and get to know each other and share our work and, get, and everything like that. So if you want to get more involved, you can email your friends at Four Winds Creative. And before we get started, too, I want to thank our hosts from Epifan Video and have them kind of, do you want to say anything? You don't? OK. <laughs> but they are awesome for hosting us all the time. So we're very grateful to Epifan. And for those watching live, thank you for tuning in. If you are, are there any? Yay, so thank you. So anyways, if you have any questions, speak up when we have questions time. Um, do we want to talk about Four Winds now or later? OK, Keith's going to talk about who's Four Winds. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Four Winds Creative is a uh, small agency in San Jose. We specialize in um, helping you communicate your uh, message to any audience necessary, lots of uh, focus on the technology and medical areas. So if you have uh, a need in that area, please reach out to Four Winds Creative. Thank you. Okay. So our awesome speaker this month is an old professor of mine, Bobak Serafin. He is a, not only a professor, but he's an accomplished director, producer, editor, and designer with over 25 years experience in the business. He's a professor at San Jose State, but when he's not teaching, he's worked on special events like Oscars, major films like Independence Day, TV shows such as Law and & Order, and many, many more. And he's a great guy if you get a chance to sit down and have a chit-chat with him because he's got some fabulous stories to tell. So without any further time, yeah. here's Bobak. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Good. <coughs> you need both mics for this to go, right? Yeah. That mic is OK? You need both mics? or? It's yeah. All right, welcome. And thank you for that introduction. Uh, well, today, when, when they asked me to talk about something, I said maybe we could talk about clients and how to kind of deal with them. I kind of titled it weird, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Nothing to do with the movie, obviously. Uh, but it was something interesting because I, I have to kind of talk about this once in a while with my students. And uh, having been working uh, through school and also um, in Hollywood and coming back here, so I have a different perspective on uh, having clients and stuff. So I, I figured I meet up mission, no? Yeah, that's me. All right, that's, here we go. That's what we're going to be starting with. So my background, I'm not going to go through the whole thing and say, well, why is he putting this? Well, it's, we're going to get together. So my background as a child, I always did drawings and paintings, and I was involved in learning music and, uh, and a lot of reading. I was sick a lot of times, so I had a lot of time to catch up and read. And it comes in handy now because storytelling is really important in whatever you do, regardless of what you're doing, lighting, scripting, audio, whatever. It, it advances a story. And, and filmmaking is all of that stuff put together. And so uh, it's a good practice. But the downside is you don't have any clients when you do those type of things as a child. Maybe if it's a class you take in and they give you an assignment for it, maybe that would be your first client experience would be having a teacher having an assignment and you fulfill that, you know. So with that in mind, a little bit more advanced to get to the point of learning more photography during my teenage years and DJing uh, music and also getting into electronic music. And that led into uh, doing a, a score for a PBS show for, for KTEH. Is it, does it still exist? I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, they kind of liked it and I kind of got involved into seeing how they do the editing stuff. And 
And the producer asked me to come into one of the edit sessions, and I gave some pointers about editing. I said, well, what are you doing? I said, I'm studying computers. I said, well, you should go into film, you know, because that might be something you might like. I said, well, yeah. Went home, told my mom. He said, no, finish computers first. Then you can do whatever the hell you want. I said, OK. <laughs> Being from an immigrant family, that's the first thing you want to do is finish what you started. And that actually became a very important part of uh, advancing my uh, career in LA. And, uh, and then also, once I studied film, I was a little bit more hungrier than the other students because I was a little bit older, two to four years maybe. And so every class I took while I was working full time as an engineering job, um, I was uh, dedicating a lot of time into photography classes and cinematography classes and all that stuff. So that helped build a really strong reel. And then uh, I was fortunate to get two student Emmys. And they invited me to Hollywood. And, and, that, and then my parents, I took them to the award ceremony. And they figured out maybe he has something there. You know, Maybe engineering might not be the thing for it. But all that time, basically, everything was stuff that I was creatively involved. And I was the one who was in charge. But I remember after graduating the undergrad, I got the fellowship or the internship for the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. And they take 26 categories out of probably about maybe 5,000 people. And then I was fortunate I took the post production and they uh, covered all the expenses and I went to LA. That was really the experience that I wanted to get. While I was doing that, I did do stuff here as a freelancer. I got from being a freshman, I worked on KTEH as the, uh, you know, the, the switching and technical directing and cameras and audio and all that stuff and anything else freelance that they had. So just to get the experience and get the, the knowledge. And, and those were clients. And I have to say, I learned a really hard lesson one time. I went on a shoot and somebody said, OK, go black the tape. And if you know what a videotape is, blacking the tape means time coding it and getting it ready for editing. And I had no idea what that meant. And then she went off on me and just started yelling at the producer, who is this guy? He doesn't know this, that. And you know, what do you do at that point? You know, um, I was ready to cry at one point, but I didn't. I said, I don't know it. You want to show me how to do it? I'll do it. That's all I could do. And then. Uh, and then luckily, the producer came and talked to her. And then she actually taught me some new things on the tape deck. And I learned that. And I never forget it till the rest of my life. Uh, and, uh, uh, but you know, I never worked with her again. But I did work with the producers. And I got a Pepsi gig from that. And I got a Coca-Cola gig, all local stuff. And I pretty much got an internship at uh, Lockheed Video and Film at the time that they were doing half film, half video at that time. And that was a great experience. So I got exposed to com you know, corporate uh, productions uh, uh, a long time ago. And, uh, and that, that really helped to build a stronger, have a different eye when I did my projects at school and kind of worked with the different advanced equipment. Uh, so the the fellowship that gave me the start was being at the heart of Hollywood at Post Group, which was one of the top post-production houses in the world at the time. And uh, they just closed down, I think, maybe 10 years ago. And uh, right now, most of the people are working either at boutique places or re they retired. Because that class of, I mean, if you look at it, this is the aerial shot from there. This whole block was Post Group at that time, which is a huge place. Uh, at, that, at that point. And it was very interesting for me because then I was working with you know, really top-notch editors and audio people. And as an intern from the academy, I could sit on any session I wanted to. They had other interns that could just okay, move the tape from here to there to eight hours a day. But I wasn't doing any of that. I was actually on sessions on you know, Michael Jackson music videos and stuff like that. And, uh, I remember uh, sitting with the David Finch for the trailer of uh, Alien 3. And then he asked me if 
if I liked the movie, and I went and saw it, and I didn't like it. So I told him the truth. And then, then they said, OK, go get something. And I never went back to that room again. And uh, so he was, he was very gentle with his stuff. But anyway, uh, so but he's a good director regardless. Um, I went back. They offered me a job. And I said no, because I wanted to go and get to grad school and get my degree. And I went to USC for three days. And then I, and I couldn't pay for the bills, so I had a full scholarship at San Diego. So I went there, and I kind of catered the program to myself so I could kind of pull off a feature film for my thesis. And that worked out well. I came up here and uh, shot the film in two months with uh, 6,500 all on 16 millimeter. I wanted to break Robert Rodriguez's record of 7,000. So I almost killed myself, lost 50 pounds, but I did manage to finish it at 6,500 bucks. So it, it worked out well in that sense. But then I was broke, so I went back to LA, went back to Post Group, and I knew people so they could transfer the film for me for free. But the catch was I had to sit there and wait for them to have it open up between TV series and this and that so they could do it. So while doing that, I learned stuff. I picked up stuff. And then they said, well, you know, we offered you a job two years ago. You still want a job? You could have it. I said, yeah, hell yeah. I'm, I'm flat broke. <laughs> My credit card is maxed out at 7000 And I need a job. So I moved there. And I started working, actually freelancing there, because I wasn't sure what I'm going to do with my film. But I was there probably working 40, 50 hours a week and then accessing the equipment to uh, finish my film. Now, the thing about that was that you had a lot of clients, I mean, high-end clients that you had to take care of. They go through the company, company books the sessions. And then if they don't like you from the beginning, that's it, especially if you're a freelancer for a big company like that. So you had to really accommodate. If they come in and ask, you know, I want a, a font, uh, a courier font, and you tell them that, hey, you know, we have a machine that is two million bucks and could do more than that, they don't care. You give them a courier font. You know, you give them what they want, and you learn that quickly. And then the other thing is having flexibility. You know, learning as much as possible with different things. Especially at that time, you could see the machine room there and. This was uh, what they called the Harry Bay, which did all the graphics. So that was the state of the art at two million and a half dollars that you could do right now in After Effects, 85% of it for you know 29.95 a month. So, um, but but the thing was that uh, clients came and they paid a lot of money, and you had clients sitting next to you, and some of those clients. You know, I mean, you're talking about big names that come in. And you have to kind of gauge people. You know, it's, it's the, one of the things that going back to me as a child or as a student and fulfilling assignments to the dot as much as possible help dealing with them. Because, and then they have different personalities. You know, Hollywood people, uh, they, you know, there's a lot of drama that goes with it. There's politics with the company. And when you work at the high-end projects, you have a post supervisor that comes and tells you, this is how we want it. Then they go back. And then the DP or the director comes in and says, well, we want it this way. And then, then the producer comes in and makes some more notes. Then you adjust it for that. And then the executive producer comes in and makes more notes. So something as simple, you know, everybody, there was an old show called Seventh Heaven. Remember that seven comes in on the line? I designed that. But it took a month. That was my first design. It went through the whole loop. And then <laughs> they went back to the first one that I did. <laughs> and I did that in five minutes. But I did make 40 hours of overtime out of it, so it was OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, you know, and then the worst client at that point when I had was uh, Fox Sports. Uh, um, producer that she quite didn't know what she wanted. So she wanted to experiment at the time with graphics and stuff. And the graphics wasn't like this now. You can go and Google stuff. I had to walk to, from Post Group there to Hollywood Library, go to the books, to graphic books or historical books, to get texture books out and 
hauled those books all the way back to post group uh, between the homeless and the drugs and the drug addicts, and then, and then scan them with a digital camera and put it into the Harry and then experiment with it. So, uh, and it wasn't something like now you could have outsource everything. You go home and go to Photoshop, sit there, grab your coffee, and then you work all night and you send something to your client. And you can email it or FTP it or transfer it somehow. Over there, they had to be there. They come over there and sit down. And, and she wanted the 16-hour day just to do that a bunch of times. And I was like, you know, it, uh, uh, I just needed a break. And then I remember we had, we had you know, all kinds of services, cappuccinos, this and that coming in. But one guy came and said, he kind of saw that I'm suffering through this second day of edit, you know, doing graphic design for this lady. He says, Hey, you want to take a cigarette break? And I don't smoke. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's about that time. I think I need my nicotine. <laughs> and I went there just for 10, 15 minutes just to take a break, took a deep breath, came back, and then uh, we continued working. And then, you know, it was a tough week, but they used that design for probably about another 12, 15 years to, as a base, you know, because when you did work on the Harry, you put all the elements on tapes for them and they had the rights to use it, and, and that's how they did it. But everybody else, you know, you know, you just had to, when somebody came into the bay, you didn't ask him, you're the producer or this or that. You just take their word for it, and you do what they ask. When the next person comes in, then you have, uh, you know, you have to change stuff. Uh, Michael Jackson, for three years, I was the uh, special effects person for his productions, and, uh, uh, he sent, he had his own producer, which when everybody sued the poor guy, he was one, another guy that sued him. But uh, uh, he came in only once in a while just to finalize the music video effects or a TV show or a TV special that he was involved with. So um, he was very cool. I actually liked his stuff. Dick Clark was the worst client I ever had. This is going on live on YouTube. <laughs> Well, he passed on, so I don't think they're going to do anything. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, again, we're going to talk a little bit about how, what makes a bad client and how you can handle it. But you go through it. You, you, I made it through, you know, and, you know, and unfortunately, they keep asking for me. So, you know, <laughs> that was something that I tried to take vacation time during that time. They, they had their seasons. Uh, most of the movie people are, are super cool because it's so big, the uh, studios are so big, and they have really seasoned supervisors for post-production. So when you worked on post-production, they were on it. You know, they knew exactly what they wanted, and then uh, most of the creative decisions were already made in the you know, offline editing, and then they had the online editing, and all I had to do is drop the effects in, and that was it. And that made it a, a lot easier. Uh, the, some of the other ones, you know, the TV networks, they're, they're tougher. Oscars is tough because they get a design or an idea and they come up and say, oh, yeah, in five days there's the broadcast and we want everything. So you had to create all the elements with the lower third and the animations that they used to do and all that stuff. And, and then it got into a point that they started using uh, 3G, I mean, uh, CGI and then you had to combine that with the two-dimensional thing. Then we did the compositing of making an alpha channel and all kinds of good stuff for them. And then, uh, and then you had to make it for all the uh, people who were nominated because you didn't know who's going to win. So it was like 16 hours for maybe four and a half days straight. And those were the tough ones because uh, that one, and then you know we had the you know uh, going to big movies after that. Uh, working at Post Group, as I, I worked probably a month and a half as a contractor, but I was there about 60 hours a week. And they came and said, well, you're here all the time. Why don't, why don't you just be part of the staff? And I said, OK. And they still paid me the same rate as that with benefits. I said, yeah, that sounds great. Except that when you had a job, you had to stay and finish it. You know, That was the only catch. And, uh, but then at the same time, uh, you made contacts. I made contacts with uh, uh, you know, the company that was Digital Domain. That was the Jim, James Cameron company. 
They started in Venice, and they actually were one of the first uh, to use the SGI machines for 3D uh, uh, programs and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah. So when you when you had the uh, when you had a machine like that, and then they started the, the whole process of doing Titanic, they brought a lot of stuff to the table. And they still needed compositing to get that uh, show done. And then at that time, uh, before, what's the biggest animation company right now? What? Disney? Pixar. Right. And Pixar is owned by who? Disney. Disney. <laughs> so at that point, uh, they, uh, the, the way that they started was Sony actually started the first animation <coughs> farmhouse, they call them, or sweatshops, I call them. And uh, they, uh, they couldn't get jobs, actually. They couldn't get anything. So what they did was, when I worked on these movies, we just did shots of compositing stuff. And they got these that they just found randomly, boutique houses. And then they went, eventually they went out of business and they changed their name to something else for Sony. Uh, Roland Emmerich started his company, uh, which was a, Metropolis was his company in Germany. And then he brought that here to do Stargate and Independence Day and Godzilla. And uh, a very picky client, but for a good cost. They demanded perfection in every compositing, but then you know they weren't you know uh, weird about it. They just asked for it, and you just had to put the time. So um, that really helps when you go through these people and they know each other, and then they talk X, Y, and Z is a good person to work with. It goes around. LA is a huge place, just like here is a huge place. But when you work with people, people know how good you are with the with the way you work and the work ethic. Uh, so after I finished uh, working there, I got my professorship here. I uh, had worked with corporate companies like this. Um, I think it was uh, 2002 when I went for an interview with Keith at Intel. Uh, yeah, remember we went to edit whatever the heck that edit room was. And then uh, he said, you, you sure you want to work? I said, yeah, I want to work here. And, and then we got to be friends and with Todd. And, and then uh, I started working there. And then, uh, then that led to working with Four Winds. You like the logo I grabbed from your screen there. <laughs> and then, uh, then also the other, you know, I've done uh, a few designs and logo designs for uh, KQED for some of the uh, older shows that they've done. And then now, a lot of work, we, we started our own uh, film production uh, company at San Jose State that we do a lot of uh, commercials and we do promotions. And at one, I think it was a, two years ago, we did a promotion actually for Four Winds. And we shoot on 35 Panavision cameras for that one. So the students get to experiment with learning and putting that on their resume. And then, uh, um, I needed a square, so I put my belated dog's picture here, Elvis, uh, to fill out the screen. Always use the negative screen, you know. But, but the point was this. I'm also doing stuff on my own. You know, I'm heavily into writing right now on some projects. And then um, I have a partner from my Hollywood days that works in New York. He's one of the top-notch colorists there. And we started a little business that randomly came and landed on our laps is that we're kind of like the fixer. You know, you see the movie uh, Pulp Fiction, you know that guy, what was his name? Hardly Cartels, Mr. Wolf. So what happens is they have this high-end project that somebody screws up the edits and the producers hate it, but they cannot give credit to the people. So they send that to us, we fix it, everybody's happy. <laughs> and we didn't know, we just got this and then we got like four or five jobs, just like bang, bang. And he's in New York, I'm in here. Thank God for computers, everybody's connected. And I never have to see a client. And, uh, but that, that's not the point, right? Yeah, so they're good. Before we start with the, have a seat. Yeah. Before we start with that is one of the biggest issues is that 
you have to be confident in what you're doing to be hired, right? If you are not up to par for certain jobs that you apply for, then you have an issue right there. And the client will, will know that, and they, you know, they're demanding if they're paying you some fair wage or something like that. So let's, let's uh, assume that everybody's perfect and you're the best person to be hired. So now we're going to talk about what the good is. Communication is number one. How good is your client in telling you what they want? They have to be clear, right? Anything that you do, audio, if it's lighting, if it's post-production, anything, they have to tell you exactly what they want. And then, uh, so some of the things that uh, freelancers have to kind of push for, not to be too pushy, but you have to deliver what they want, so you have to be clear with that. You have to make sure that you understand, and good clients understand that. They always say, okay, you get an email. If you have more questions, just contact us, or me, or whatever, and that's a good thing to do. Uh, they'll give you a reasonable amount of time to do something, right? Uh, if you're doing a, a, a five-minute video, this is, I mean, everybody's gone through it. Uh, if you're in business, somebody comes up to you as a friend, oh, I'm trying to do a five-minute video, how much would that cost? What's the answer to that? I'll tell them to go Google. Because I want to explain what format you want to shoot on, what locations you want to get, who's your cast, what type of crew you want. If you don't understand that stuff, that's the, right now, that's on you to make those points clear. Now, if they really are serious about it, then you can educate them. But if they're not educated about it, you're going to have a heck of a time. And then uh, also, reasonable amount of time to do your job because they understand what the process is. That's a good producer right there if, when they know that. They're available for questions. Very important. They pay on time and they pay you a fair wage, right? So that's really important and you have to clear that with them. And then also, uh, they're honest about their business deals, right? They don't go out and, you know, you, you said you work with one thing and then, you know, suddenly they go and copy that for 10 other people. You know, they mark a face on there and then just have that done. So, and then also give credit. A lot of those companies you saw, we didn't get credit as a person. We got credit as a company, and as a team, as a compositing team, as a CGI team and stuff. Nothing wrong with that. But when client came and said, hey, who did that Michael Jackson fix on this thing? Then they said, oh, it's Bobek from our team from you know, compositing on this graphic bay. So that's good right there. But if they say, oh, it was me, my idea, and everything like that, then you know you got an issue. Uh, the bad, huh? <laughs> what makes a client annoying? That's, this is your part. You can say it. So hounding you, right? That's something that is, is very uh, popular about uh, you know, how they are. What's a needy client? You need this, I need that, I need this, I need blue m and I need that, I need that. Every, well, every, every little thing, every little thing. Yeah, exactly. Not just, just in that sense, but, but being expecting you to edit something for them you know, produce something, from, you're on a shoot, and they want to email every 10 minutes of an update. Well, that's impossible to do. But there are people who are like that. And then if they don't pay you, they don't pay you the fair wage of what you're supposed to get paid, right? I mean, um, it, it's something that, uh, you know, you have people coming up to you in this business that say, oh, so I heard you do videos. Uh, you know, can you come to my cousin's wedding and, and take some videos for them? They ask me that, you know. And then I say, oh, I'm busy that day. I, say, well, I haven't told you the date. I said, that's why I'm busy that day. <laughs> so you just kind of, you know, kind of diffuse the situation with humor or something else to get rid of them. And then, uh, you know, they could go find something. Again, Google is great. You know, it's just like you could blame it on Google. Give them some homework to do. This is another way to see their client. Give them homework. If they pass that homework, then they know that you can work with them or not. Uh, 
the ones that don't pay on time, what do you do? What, most of us send the bill for 30 days net. What happens if somebody doesn't pay at 30 day net? What are you going to do? What? Yeah? You can do that. <laughs> but you have to do it. I mean, that's the thing to do it is you have to tell them beforehand that the terms, you officially need to have a contract, but it's not a huge deal. But you have to tell them, hey, it's a 30 days net. If you don't meet this certain date, it's going to be late fees, this and that added to it. Uh, so the worst one, the ugly, there is no ugly one. They're only bad or good. The reason I say the clients that could be ugly is that, they, uh, that you have to kind of deal and make sure that you keep the client in line because uh, they could take away everything from you. Because if you're having a, if you're freelancing, this is not your only project, only life. You have other things going on. Like one of the things you saw as, as, as a child, I had did different things. Still to this date, I can't do one thing at a time. I have to have like five projects going on at the same time. It's just that way I work. So you have to make sure that they understand that. And, and then do you really want to work with them again? If, you know, some of, the, some of the people, they just come up and they're just horrible. You, just, you say, you know what, I'm not going to work with them again. Never say that out loud. <laughs> you avoid them as much as possible, but you never know. They might go to another company that you get hired on. But if you were not pleasant with them then, you know, you're not, you know they're going to say that and they're not going to hire you. But what you can do is this. You learn from the last project. What were the mistakes? It, I'm going to clear it with this person. Hey, uh, you know what? I need you know, two hours to light this scene. I can't do it in 10 minutes with an LED light. Or you, know, <laughs> you want a Hollywood, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, Hollywood production with champagne budget? Well, that's not going to work. You know? And that's the thing that you have to clear. Whatever that, is not, that doesn't go well with your system, you clear it out politely and you talk about it. So that way you won't get the issues down the line. So some tips. <coughs> um, some tips that, that uh, I felt that helped is always research your clients, know the company, what do they stand for, what do they do, if it's a producer, uh, you know, what type of reputation that person has, are they, do they deliver uh, stuff, what kind of projects they have online and that you can look at their stuff, uh, is the business good? Has anybody, you know, what is it, Yelp now does stuff even for video productions and all those type of things too? Do they have a good rating, bad rating? Uh, what is their standing? And then also understanding what their goals are, right? And what, they, the, what, the, what, their, what their specialties are. You know, some people just do weddings, which is really smart. That's because it's a whole different genre. I did once a wedding as a student, and that was my last one. And I said, I'm not going to do it again. It was for Jim LeFewer's wedding, actually. <laughs> Our SJSU <laughs> mentor at the time. And I said, that's it. I'm not going to do it again, you know. Uh, but I did deliver it, you know. Uh, listening is the key, right? You sit down and brainstorm with a client, that's no problem. You take notes at the beginning, and you just take, absorb all that stuff. But it's better to just take a little bit of a break Go home, have some thinking to do, and kind of think about it, and then set up another meeting to go over it with your client. Because they're excited about their project. They want to show you what they want. They want to tell you what they're expecting. And they don't want to lecture from you on, at, at the first day, oh, that's a horrible idea. You know, uh, We should use elephants instead of, you know, uh, little stuffed animals or something like that. You know, those type of things, you can negotiate things later, but not at the time. So listening is a good deal. Uh, making notes and then uh, and ask questions. While you're brainstorming on your own things, on your own terms, uh, you can ask questions. So here's the thing. This, this, this is kind of general about how you work. 
uh, I had a, a grip and lighting person that I hired for a job. And I know how usually it works. I usually like to have a technical run through beforehand, go to the place, find where the electrical box are so the g and &E go and figure things out. And so no, no, it'd be fine. And I know it's not going to be fine. Because when we <laughs> went there, you know, that person didn't have a clue how to hook that up to that box because he didn't bring the necessary hookup. And that's the thing that you want to avoid is just that you make notes, you go and see if you could rent the thing. Okay, if you need a special box, how much is it? Do you let the client know? Otherwise, you know, you don't want to burn down the place that you're shooting in. Uh, the budget that you put on it, make sure that it's an it's a, it's a honest budget. You don't want to overprice stuff. You don't want to short, you know, sell yourself short. And, and remember your skill set, too. That's really important. You know. uh, what you bring as a, a student intern is, is different than somebody with you know, 20 years plus experience. And uh, that's understandable. And now the industry is changing, too. I mean, a lot of those Hollywood places that are gone out of business is because of a kind of a generation shift as well. So they might go and hire, I mean, everybody's watching the Super Bowl commercials still? Yes? So if you worked, we worked at Post Group, we, we worked on commercials for Budweiser that the budget was four million to do, right? Now you get some startup company that has a couple people with the DSLRs go out and shoot. They spend 100,000 on that, but they pay you know, 20 million to advertise it. So it's, it's completely different. It's opposite of what it was before. And it's not bad or good or anything like that. It's just that as a freelancer, you want to be aware of the trends that are happening and uh, how your clients are imagining things that, yes, you, know, you have three lights here uh, that are LED. And you know, you're not going to get in an argument with Mole Richardson and LED versus that because they don't care. They just want this image to be transported and shown on YouTube or this or that. So be aware of that type of uh, uh, stuff. Uh, <clears throat> if you're producing stuff for a client and you take care of everything, or you know, you're farming out different things, if they give you a graphic section to do and you have to pick 3D people or you're shooting something special for somebody, Make sure that that crew is reliable. Right? Last thing you want is somebody to sink you because you don't have confidence in their work. And you don't know and you haven't worked with them before. There's nothing wrong with hiring somebody new, but you don't hire somebody new for a very crucial job. You want to test them first. Right? So it's important that if you farm out stuff, you also observe people. I do a lot of that when we have students when we do productions, and I know who's working, who's not working on the set. And uh, you know, we have a lot of people out uh, that, uh, uh, that are working. Danielle called me her old professor. I would rather say seasoned professor. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, make sure the crew that you pick is important. Now, finally, diplomacy is the key. Right? What is diplomacy? It's a, it's, yes, it's being able to compromise. You won't get your way all the time, so might as well get some of it and give in onto some of it. But if they're paying for it, you have to give up a little bit more. Right? So that's important. And then also, uh, if they have a bad idea, I mean, everybody, if you freelance, some, you're going to have clients that come up with a horrible idea that is going to bring up the cost, it's going to bring up everything. And and we all have that. I mean, if you look at it, we all have clients. The studios have clients. Who are the clients for studios? Executive producers. Most likely, more of them are from outside of this country now investing in it, right? And then the producers report to the executive producers. And then they, uh, in turn, everybody else has to report to the producers. So everybody has somebody to answer to. And what is, like, let's say, uh, Scorsese? as an author, has a lot of pull in Hollywood. Who does he answer to? Yes, exactly, right? Two flops on the big screen, and that's it. 
Uh, if you watch it, it's a great documentary about Orson Welles on Netflix right now and about his last film. And that gives you a really good insight on how things, how not, how not working with the client like Hollywood will kill you, basically. Literally and in, in a career wise. So make, you know, that's a good lesson to learn from that. Uh, this is important if you're doing post. How many times do you give a client a revision? I'm not going to ask Jack <laughs> till his email box blows out. <laughs> what is it? What do you think? Uh, two, the original contract, right? so two revisions. Two revisions. So three versions, and then one more, start charging more. Yes, exactly. So you have to clear those with your client, right? You give one and let them go. They can rip it to parts, and then that's OK. You figure that one out. But if they do that, and then they come back in the fourth revision and ask you, then you say, well, you know what? I'd be more than happy to do it, but it's going to cost time and money. And that's how you do it. The worst one is Hollywood clients, because then you have post supervisor, editor, director, DP, this, that. Everybody has their own version of the thing. So you know, it takes a long time to get anything done. But overall, <clears throat> make sure you love what you're doing. If you don't like what you're doing, doesn't matter how much they pay you, it's not going to work. Right? I'm not sure if you could say it, but I think it's PG-13, is that you get paid, and if you love your job, you get paid to take a certain amount of bullshit. And if you love your job, that bullshit won't bother you. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bobak. We're going to take some questions. Does anyone have a question for Bobak? Anyone? Like the Bueller. Thank you. Yeah, sure. right. Say your name. My, my name is Evan. Thank you, Bob. I, yeah. You said Dick Clark was your worst client. Would you talk about what made that such a bad experience for you? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, it was one of the things that I said is being kind of cheap about things, it makes it very hard. And because what did uh, that company get big on? Everybody knows. I think our generation might know. New Year's is one of their, just one show out of the whole thing. Yeah, and then, but the main thing was game shows, right? And the variety shows. They had the interview shows, and then they had the New Year, and then they did a lot of other stuff. The problem was that they wanted, they'd come in at exactly, and most of the time I worked, I liked the swing shift, and uh, I worked from 4 to 12, ideally, but usually it went over all the time. But they will book at 10 p.m. And they will come up with a project, and they want it done by 12. So you don't go into overtime. And then, if you didn't do it, they would go and complain to the operations manager. And the operations manager would go in the morning and call to the producer. And the producer talked to the suits of the company. And 4 p.m., when you show up, oh, this guy wants to talk to you for a bit. And then, and then you come in. But luckily, they were like that with everybody, from our editing department to telecine and film transfer to graphics. So when that happened, none of that would have happened. You know, just like you try to diffuse it as much as possible. But because of his name, they still took him. And then the owner at the time for Post Group was a good friend of his from the 70s. But those are the things. You know, they just do cheap tricks to get going. You know, Versus when you had somebody coming in, for example, uh, when you did movies, a uh, lot of the effects that we did for movies was for airline version, right? What was the issue at that time? You had one monitor for everybody sitting on the plane, right? So you, you couldn't have nudity and, and things you know, that were kind of offensive for kids and this. So we did a lot of boob removals. And we put like bikinis on people and stuff like that. And then... Uh, they had the budget. They said, do whatever you want to do. Take your time and do whatever you want to do. Like they, didn't, they didn't even show up in the bay. You just send it to them. If there was an issue, they send it back. But they trusted you. And that, those were you know, really good clients. Uh, but you know, they trusted. Again, it comes back to trust and how much you're confident in your work. Answer your question. So I mean, we all deal with this. Um, keeping a game face. I mean, you're churning inside, right? They're asking for ridiculous things. Right. The timeline's ridiculous, or 
it's just the worst idea you've ever heard, but the, the executive came up with this great idea and everyone goes, yeah, it's a great idea. Bob, our executive, right. has the best idea. Here it is, blah, blah, blah. What are your personal strategies for dealing, you know, having that kind of game face and, and making right. it work? Well, that one is a tough one, again, because you have the hierarchy of people and you think you're done with your project, especially with corporate stuff, you might have like even a big company that you, you think that is your client and you give the revisions and they're happy with it and then they call Bob. And Bob has completely different idea how it should be. So the thing comes back uh, is, do they cover the budget to redo stuff, right? And I know you might be fuming because you worked so hard on it, but I think the key is this, that on those type of projects, even though you did the creativity is there and you're doing something they want, is that you still have to realize that ultimately they have to say they're okay. And you just have to kind of calm yourself down. Go have a smoke of cigarette. And then, you know, calm down for a little bit. Just go out and walk. You know, I want to go to the bathroom break for 15 minutes and come back. Whatever, just to calm down, and then you tell them, this is it. If you want to change this, no problem. This is how many hours it's going to take to do that. This is how many times we have to do this. How many times it's going to take to encode it, et cetera, et cetera. It's a tough one, but you have to kind of bite your tongue and, and deal with it. Yeah. And there's always the director's cut. Uh, <laughs> well, they say always director's cut, but then you know what? It's always the executive producer that ruins it for everybody, you know. Hi, I'm Hillary. Hi. Is this working? Okay. Um, so I was actually just going to ask uh, something related to the director's cut. So what are the expectations in post-production as far as who has what creative control into the edit or even things, you know, during production as far as lighting and how the aesthetics right. are conveyed? You're talking about uh, kind of like a Hollywood production or you're talking about corporate or... Um, Indie, in corporate, okay. or whatever. Well, uh, in a general rule, because what happens is as it gets a bigger production, you have more people involved. So uh, most of the time, uh, when you do an EDL or edit decision list, you, that's the time the actual editor, editor who makes storyline decision making, sits down with the director and they go through everything. And once that gets approved by a producer or an entity that is going to be the network or the release, then they get a cut for them. And then they test it out, and if that's okay, if not, then they go back and cut it again. And if that's okay, then it goes to be online and all the special effects will get done. You see what I'm saying? So it, during the first cut, all the creative decision making has to get done. Because once picture lock comes in, it's super expensive to, especially now, even though you're not working with film anymore as much, uh, even having an 8K or a 5K image, you know, kind of doing an intermediate color correction on that, you need the high resolution. And you cannot grab 50 hours of footage that you shot on the field and bring and color correct everything. You do that on music videos. I've done it on music videos and commercials, but you, want, you don't want to do it on a feature. Stanley Kubrick was notorious for that. The editor, almost all of them, at one point tried to commit suicide because they got about hundreds, thousands of, of film. And then they wouldn't, he wouldn't circle take. He wouldn't circle take because on film you needed circle take because otherwise if it wasn't good, you wanted to not send it to the lab and make the expense. So. Uh, so the, the whole point is that creative decision making usually does on the first cut, then you have the other people have their say on it. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, you mentioned um, you had really good clients in, in some of the people you worked with. Uh, let's talk about repeat clients a little bit. What is it that you do to build trust so that you get repeat clients so they come Very back? Good. Very good point. Project after project, and they trust you to get it done without interfering right. in that creative process. Right. That's an excellent point. It comes back to your, again, being confident in what you're doing. So basically not BSing a client that I can do it, but you cannot deliver that. Okay, so that's first rule is be honest about your skill set. And then 
the thing is, again, if you want to work beyond time, if the client wants something at a certain time, you deliver on that. If the client wants you to, uh, you know, uh, change stuff as agreed, you change stuff. You don't make an excuse on the second or third revision. Usually three revisions is the is norm. Uh, that is, oh, you know what, I'm, uh, uh, that day I, I'm, I'm going to uh, a baseball game and then so I can't, uh, no, you have to make time. So you make those times and schedules for that. You sacrifice certain birthdays and parties and this and that to make the goal happen. Because it's not your, the client's fault that, you know, you have to, uh, go to your cousin's party and videotape their party, you know, and it's it's sticking with whatever that you do. But I think the main thing is also being a good person and a good citizen, somebody that you can relate to, the client can relate to you. And uh, you know, if you're a jerk, nobody wants to work with you. It doesn't matter your skill sets. There's a lot of people here, even in Bay Area, I know that they know. You know, you give them a Adobe Premiere, they know. 50,000 buttons on it, but nobody wants to work with them, you know, and because they don't have the skill set. And I, I'm glad you said that because there's other things that's changing too, you know, because the generation of, 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 of uh, uh, people are getting into this business are also changing, you know. Uh, you have a more isolated youth that are getting into this where maybe the skill set of conversing with people, selling yourself as a freelancer, then you know that networking and all that stuff um, is not taught to them anymore. You know, you have to go on YouTube to find how to mingle with people now. <laughs> you know, it's, it's that type of thing where, where before the human touch was very important and the way you talk to it. And I think those type of things is very important to, again, uh, being on time, delivering what your client wants, and, uh, and then you know, having a relationship. Just like you have a relationship with your friends and family and other people. Uh, yes, yeah, so you have boundaries and stuff. Uh, you, know, you don't want to pie the face of the client just for a joke. But you know the boundaries, but you want to keep that going. You know, and uh, I think that's a way to handle it. I would do it that way, yeah. Are there any more questions? Oh, oh, that's for the raffle. Right. I'll get to yeah. that. All right. So, who? Everybody should have a number. Does everyone have a number? Because I know some people did not. They came in late. So grab a number right out of there. And then whoever has a number, put it in this cup. Remember your number. Number. Yeah. We're going to use our brain skills today, remembering your number. Oh, here you go. Yep. Oh, that's right. Keith, did you get a number? This is a high tech. Right. Um, anyone else got a number? Oh, over oh, here. Hold on. Put the number back. Yes. Just, just, just remember what number you had. Know where, where my number went? I don't even care. Okay. And you get, grab Louis's oh, too. You guys, get, you guys got numbers. Okay, <laughs> great. But I Sorry, didn't know where my went. Perfect. All right. Do we have all the numbers? Wait, so you got a number? Yeah, I did. All right. Wonderful. You got you guys? Yep. Yeah. Okay. You got your number in here? I don't even know where mine is. Okay. It's fine. So I got everything here. And I give you the honors to you. Ten. Who had number ten? Oh, Jack. Jack. Well, <clears throat> I promised on Facebook to give whoever wins the raffle gets a five and a quarter inch floppy. Hey, come on up. <laughs> Let's get a picture of this. Hold on. And it, it, it still has some edits from uh, 50 years ago. I'm so honored. Jack, turn around, look at me. Thank you. <laughs> That's scary. All right. All right. All right. So if anyone doesn't have any more questions, then we'll just wrap up this portion. And I just have a few more things to say. Oh, yes. Go ahead. The photo of you with that crew that dancers? Yeah. Is that Andy Olsen in the upper left? Yeah. yeah. You, I know, you probably know most of them. Yeah. They're Andy Olsen, yeah. He was my buddy. Actually, uh, we started out together, and we screwed up Lefebvre's wedding. <laughs> Are we still That's broadcasting? Why you do weddings anymore. Oh, well, I shouldn't be talking that story. When you cut that off, then I'll tell the story. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So, any more questions? No. All right. So, if you guys want to get more involved in the group, you can email us at your friends 
at fourwindscreative.com because we try to host these ev about every other month, every six weeks or so. And we only got one submission from Hillary um, for our December meetup, and so we are going to cancel it, and then we're going to try to have it next year. I apologize. So we want to wish everyone a happy holidays, and we are really looking forward to seeing you next year. All right, hope you guys have a great holiday season and drive safe on the way home. Absolutely. Your friends at fourwindscreative.com.